I'd like to thank Jill for that very uh, nice introduction. Uh, what I propose to talk about uh, is the Irish economy, how it got into the difficulties it is in today, uh, how to analyse those difficulties, and I hope to point to some positive uh, factors that should give us some confidence that we can overcome our difficulties. Now, I know that you may want to ask me questions about the European Union, um, about international affairs, about things that are not to do with Ireland. Uh, I'm more than happy to answer questions on anything that you have in your mind, but uh, I want to just focus on one topic because I think it's the topic that is much in people's minds at the moment. Uh, I prepared my, I don't usually read scripts, but in fact, as I think this is an important address and an important platform. I actually have prepared some written remarks, so I hope you'll forgive me if I, if I go through those. I think I might ad lib them uh, rather more long-windedly than I might read them, and I don't want to be trespassing unduly on your limited time. I should start by saying that the views I am about to express are entirely my own and don't represent any organisation that I ever had anything to do with or now have. Uh, I think it's very important that we should keep a sense of proportion about the current economic difficulties of this country. It's true that those difficulties have been aggravated uh, by the international credit crisis, but the crisis did no more than bring to the surface uh, what were a series of entirely homegrown mistakes. Essentially, both as families, as businesses, and as a state, we've been borrowing far more than we should and spending much of it very badly over the last 10 years. While it may have been difficult for the financial regulators in the central bank or the uh, other authorities to quantify the risk uh, if Irish banks were buying collateralised debt obligations, it is not difficult at all and was not difficult at all to see that for the private sector to be borrowing ever larger amounts of money to invest almost exclusively in one notoriously volatile sector, namely construction, was bound to be wrong. Any student of, economic, uh, of economics and, uh, um, will, 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 will know that, uh, and I was studied national economics in my first year in UCD uh, before I passed any exams, knows full well that the construction sector in Ireland and in any other country almost is volatile by its nature. Uh, and any family that ever worked in the building trade would also know that the construction industry is volatile. So it was obvious if a lot of money was being borrowed to go into one sector, that was very, very risky. Equally, you didn't have to have a degree in higher mathematics to know that setting ever higher levels of public spending and employing ever no larger numbers of staff who were going to be permanently employed on the basis of revenues that were tied directly to the ups and downs of that same volatile construction sector in the form of uh, stamp duty on house sales was not sensible. You cannot responsibly pay for an ongoing liability with revenues that are not ongoing. These obvious mistakes by both the private and the public sectors since 2000 were not sufficiently criticised at the time. And I think it's useful to analyse why we didn't criticise what were quite obvious mistakes. Uh, group thinking went in just one direction unquestioning acceptance that present conditions would continue indefinitely, or at worst, that there would be a soft landing. No other possibility was seriously entertained. The unwillingness to hear contrarian views about the economy existed, in my view, because there is a gen general tendency in this country to form one consensus view of things, one politically correct version, so to speak, of what's happening and to leave little space for dissent from that consensus. Uh, I remember the late Deputy and Professor John Morris Kelly drawing attention to this in a very different era in the 1960s and 70s. This orientation towards 
an accepted consensus is part of what we are. Social partnership, from which we have derived many benefits, also stifled critical debate on economic policy in the interests of consensus. There were, however, deeper reasons for this failure to have any questioning of what were, on their face, obvious uh, mistakes that we were making. Democratic dissent is not something that we value as much as we should in this country, perhaps because we've had to put up with so much violent and non-democratic dissent in the past. Uh, when people say something that questions the consensus view in this country on any topic, the first reaction uh, in both the media and in private conversation is not as it should be to ask whether this question or questioner has something valid to say, but rather our first reaction is to ask ourselves, what's their ulterior motive? What's in this for them that they're saying that? Uh, or, very often in the media, to go back through one's files and find, oh, they said something different five years ago, so we shouldn't pay any attention to what they're saying now because they aren't entirely consistent. Uh, that, these are the defense mechanisms that we use to prevent ourselves from actually thinking. Um, we failed, I think, also to draw the right conclusions uh, from our recovery from the recession of the 1980s. The view became accepted in public commentary and was given respectability by many economists that our recovery in the 1980s was mainly due to our own efforts, to social partnership, and that somehow or other we discovered an Irish elixir for economic growth. The Irish miracle was something that we were more than willing to believe in, even as we were as skeptical uh, people as far as other miracles were concerned in other contexts. In fact, if you analyze it, uh, the improvement in our financial position after 1987 was mainly due to a sudden fall in international interest rates in 1988 and to a dramatic fall off in the dependency ratio as between the 1980s and the 1990s. Growth was slow in the 1980s because we had a disproportionately large number of dependent children who, wonderful and all as they are, cost money. <laughs> but then miraculously, and this is the Irish miracle, these children grew up. And in the 1990s, they were young adults with very good educations who were able to work. One would almost have had to try very hard indeed with that demography not to have had an economic miracle in Ireland in the 1990s. But we assumed that it was for entirely different reasons. It had nothing to do with international interest rates, nothing to do with demography. It was all due to social partnership and our own you know, brilliance in making as few small cuts in public spending in the late 1980s. So even those who knew in their hearts that there was something wrong with the way we were borrowing and spending after 2000 felt that somehow or other, against all logic, we had discovered a magic formula and everything would turn out all right in the end as it had in the 1980s. Or alternatively, they just kept their views to themselves because they didn't want to be mocked as unpatriotic, unimaginative or obsessed with bookkeeping, the worst possible insult in politics. I hope that, therefore, one positive outcome of the current problem will be that we will be, in future, willing to allow more space for debate and argument about options and risks before we pick, take big decisions, and that we will allow more space for politically incorrect opinions in economics and in other fields of life. Equally, we must now ensure that we do not form a new national consensus of despair. Just as between 2000 and 2007, we looked only on the bright side, we must not now only see the dark side of our situation. Looking at the national economic situation now, I feel we're focusing far too much on the liability of the banks and too little on the ongoing huge gap between government's daily spending and its daily revenue. The net liability of the banks 
of Anglo-Irish, and I think it's only Anglo-Irish that we're really talking about, the rest of the money will eventually come back, is a finite amount. Even if you don't know exactly what the figure is, it is a finite figure. It will be a one-off liability for the taxpayer, probably about 15, maybe 20% of our annual gross domestic product. Now, that is a huge figure, but we should be able to spread it over a number of years if we manage things properly. The much more vital issue to discuss and to obsess about is the gap between spending and revenue, which is running at about 10% of our GDP every year. That's not a one-off figure. It is something that could require us to add, to the difference, add the difference to our debt inexorably, multiplying the total amount we owe. In other words, every year, the gap between spending and revenue is adding almost another Anglo to our debt every year, year after year, as we go forward. And yet, that's not being discussed or analysed in the same way as we are discussing blaming people for the past. We're not talking about decisions for the future. I would prefer if the energies of our lively, now lively, economic commentariat were devoted as much to how we can bridge that recurring gap as the art of the one-off banking liability. The recurring gap between spending and revenue is something we will have control over and do have control over now. The banking liability is something that, is, that has already happened. And although we can argue about the sharing of the burden, there is no way we can retrospectively reduce the liability. It is the gap between ongoing spending and ongoing revenue that worries the more thoughtful participants in the financial markets also. If we had a budget surplus, the problems of Anglo-Irish Bank would be seen in a different light than they are. The recent quarterly economic commentary of the ESRI draws attention to the fact that income per head in Ireland is now back to what it was in 2000. That's quite a drop from the unsustainable levels of income per head that reached, we reached in 2006. But nobody can seriously suggest that Ireland was a poor country in 2000. We had a solid economy in 2000, something we didn't have in 2006. Now, I do accept that averages of income per head like this don't tell the whole story. There are a lot of people who are worse off now than they were or their equivalents were in 2000. But if that's the case, there are also a significant number of people who are a lot better off than they were in 2000. Furthermore, there are things that are not measured in income statistics that are better than they were in 2000. Our roads, our accessibility to hotels and cultural facilities, our public transport, these are all better than they were in 2000. Not all the money was wasted. But of course, we tend to be more concerned about things that we personally have lost or may lose than we are about improvements for the community generally. That's human nature. If we look for positive signs about the Irish economy, they are there before our eyes. Exports are buoyant this year, rising faster than in most European countries. In fact, Irish exporters, exports also fell much less in 2008 and 2009 than exports did in most other countries. Uh, this general trend in Irish exports being less susceptible to the downturns in the economy shows that we are invested in robust sectors here in Ireland, whereas some of our continental neighbours are more heavily invested in sectors like cars, which are much more volatile than our investments in pharmaceuticals software and so forth. And while it is true, as I've said, that the Irish public sector still has unresolved debt and deficit problems, Irish households have paid back a lot of their debts in the last year. The private savings rate is now 10% as against 2% in 2007. People are saving uh, 
a much increased share of their income. And according to the Economic and Social Research Institute, in 2009, there was a net increase in the net financial assets of Irish households, you and me, of almost 25 billion euros. Irish households are 25 billion euros richer at the end of this year than they were at the beginning of this year. And that arises from a payment down of debt, repayment of debt of 5 billion, and a, an increase in the value of the assets we own in pension funds and insurance policies of about 20 billion. Of course, this improvement in the net financial position starts from a very high level of indebtedness, and it is unevenly distributed, but 25 billion of an improvement in our private financial position isn't bad. Uh, some sectors have come through the uh, crisis particularly well. The international financial services industry, uh, which is quite separate from the domestic banking sector, has done remarkably well. It is spread all over Ireland and is creating and sustaining highly skilled jobs, especially for young Irish people with good mathematical competence. I've been, been struck since taking on the role uh, of how diverse the international financial in services industry in Ireland is and how much inventiveness has been uh, applied to using information technology by Irish people here in Ireland to serve global financial services needs for the entire globe on a 24 hour a day, uh, 365 days a year basis. Our relative competitive position has also been substantially improved as a direct result of the recession. House and apartment rents have fallen, new office rents have fallen, wage costs have fallen, and prices have fallen all faster than they've fallen in other competing European countries. Staff turnover is much less than it was in 2006. So now an employer coming into Ireland finds it's more worthwhile to train Irish employees because they are fairly confident that they won't be heading off on a round-the-world tour or switching jobs twice a year as they were during the earlier period. That makes all of these things make us a more attractive place now to invest in. The industrial society, with its emphasis on disciplined repetition of tasks, didn't particularly suit Irish people. Um, in contrast, the information society, with its emphasis on adaptability and innovation and trying things a different way, suits us perfectly. Ireland is also an open society and has handled the transition to a multi-faith, multi-ethnic society much better than have some of our European neighbours. This will be a big help to us in attracting foreign investment here, especially from the emerging economies of the world, India, China, Brazil, where the predominant ethnicity is not European. In fact, I think Irish people have a better instinctive understanding of the way the world is changing than do some of our continental neighbours who are now convulsed by a very backward-looking debate about ethnicity and immigration. Between 2000 and, and 2010, the global out output share of the advanced economies fell from two-thirds of everything produced in the world to a half, while the share of places like China, India, the Middle East, and Brazil, where the immigrants in Ireland today have come from, many of them, has risen dramatically. These are increasingly the people with the money, I see two of them here in this room, I'm glad to say. Um, I'll be going to China this month and to the Gulf States later this year to seek investment from these rapidly growing countries in the Irish financial services industry. And I believe that the fact that Ireland, better than most of our neighbours, possibly because we don't have a colonial legacy and possibly because we've all of us known people who have had to emigrate themselves in the past, the fact that we have welcomed immigrants from the same parts of the world that are now the emerging economies will make it much easier to persuade those emerging economies to invest in Dublin or in Carrick and Shannon 
or in somewhere like that, than to invest in a country that has a colonial legacy, where immigrants from their own ethnicities are not made particularly welcome, where they're not allowed to dress as they wish, or whatever. I think also Irish people have proved themselves to be remarkably more sensible when it comes to making the painful economies and cuts that are needed to adapt to our reduced economic circumstances than have other societies. The contrast between the, I won't say passive, but resigned acceptance of difficult things here in this country and the street theatre, the fatuous street theatre we're seeing in France and Greece could not be more marked. While the tendency to which I referred to of too much orientation towards consensus in this country may in the past have prevented us from questioning what was going on between 2000 and 2006, that same consensus may now be helping us, or that same tendency to consensus may now be helping us to come together under whatever government we may have to make the necessary decisions to reduce that really dangerous gap between spending and revenue. Yes, we do have to learn a good deal from our mistakes. Yes, we will have to make some painful changes. Government services will be reduced and the direct and indirect tax base will have to be broadened. But the fundamental human resource base of the Irish economy remains young, adaptable and well-educated. And that's what provides the basis for economic recovery. The challenge today is as much psychological as financial. What, it, what is needed now is a five to ten year perspective. Like the economic development document that was produced by Ken Whitaker in 1958. What we need now is a similar document that shows us a credible linkage between sacrifices today and results five to ten years from now, and which explains the necessary difference between intelligent risk-taking and reckless speculation. If a much smaller public service in 1958 could produce a document like the document Economic Development that transformed the psychological attitude of this country and enabled us to develop through the 60s, the 70s and the 80s, right up to the present time. I don't see why a much bigger and much more expertise-stuffed public service couldn't do a similar job for us going forward uh, into the next decade. Thank you very much. <laughs>